Welcome to Recalibrate Reality, the future of New York. Our guest today is Marianne Tai, CEO of the tri-state arm of CBRE, the world's largest provider of commercial real estate services. In this episode, Mary and I discuss the state of New York's office market, how companies may want to bring workers back to the office, and the importance of sound public policy to fuel economic growth. And so now, let's recalibrate reality with Mary Ann Tai. Mary Ann, welcome to Recalibrate Reality. Thank you. So, so Mary Ann, you know, a, a year, a year and a half ago, uh, so many people were talking about the future of New York. And, you know, New York really thrives on the commerce and the companies that occupy our big office towers. And there was a question as to, are these companies coming back? Will they, you know, they come to New York or will they look for other parts around the country? Will they have people start working remotely? And, and you as the, as the CEO of the New York region for CBRE, spend your life talking to the CEOs and decision makers uh, about you know, what, how they're thinking about their future. So let's start with that. When you speak to these decision makers, what do they tell you about their commitment to New York, how important it is to their business, and, uh, and they're bringing their workforce back? I would say in the medium and large size companies, I have not encountered the person who said, we're hybrid forever and I'm shedding off the space. That has not happened uh, in, in my experience. And what I can say that is universal is the uncertainty as to how the workforce will react. And yet the certainty that people, that management is feeling that work working together is superior to working remotely. That part of the narrative is new. Remember how in the, in, in the immediate aftermath of COVID, everyone said the same thing. We're so productive. We may even be more productive because we're not commuting, et cetera. Um, that part of the narrative has fallen away entirely. And I think that people are actually recognizing uh, the loss of, a, and part of it, by the way, may just be an energy loss because it's very enervating doing this uh, remote uh, interaction eight, 10 hours a day. Um, and as a consequence of that, that part of the narrative has shifted entirely, even while there's a recognition that flexibility is a good thing, it may even be considered a perk, and therefore what's the right mix for both the company and the individual functions within the company. But I, I, I'm not hearing the boy, can we save a boatload of money by shedding space? Uh, not at all. Right. And, and you yeah. hear from, from some of these different, uh, or reading the headlines, you know, uh, company expanding in, in Texas, a company expanding in Florida, uh, et cetera. I mean, you know, in the importance of New York to these companies, um, how paramount is that as they, they're thinking about their future strategic plans for, for the workplace? I think it's it's probably only important uh, if intellectual capital matters, and it's only important if you want to scale your business. Other than that, it's not important at all. <laughs> um, and, and I should say one other thing: if whatever you're doing requires a diversity of skill sets, I began looking for space for a customer of mine who uh, was going to hire thousands of people and was moving jobs out of New York. And we used our very wonderful labor CBRE's labor analytics people based in Arizona to do an analysis of what workforce existed in these various uh, cities around the United States. And uh, Mark Seeley, the guy who heads um, our, our analytics practice, labor analytics practice said to me, now how soon will they ramp up to this? I'm gonna make up the number 5,000 jobs. And I said, well, uh, what do you mean, ramp up, uh, you know, 18 months? He's like, oh, none of these cities. And we're talking about the usual suspects, right? Tampa, Austin, Charlotte, et cetera, you know, Raleigh. Um, the scale of these cities are not such that you're gonna be able, you're gonna change the pay scale of this type of skill set in those cities, if you actually try to do what you're doing that fast. He said, now, if you said to me, seven years, five to seven years, there'd be enough time to grow that base. So that's when I said to him, 
I, I don't understand how Amazon was interviewing all of these cities for their HQ2. And he said, yeah, we thought it was one of the most brilliant marketing ideas ever because there was no way they were going to any of those cities. And it was such a shock to me to realize that our scale, oddly enough, is unique in the United States. Nobody approaches 8.8 .8 million people, but it's not just our scale, it's the complete diversity of that population. Obviously, and you're an expert on the region, and if you look at the regional population, and as, as one of my customers often says to me, it's not just that New Yorkers, you know, if I want to go and get the food from my native country cooked the way we really cook it, there's a place in Queens for me to go, right? right. Um, you know, there may be a place in Manhattan that pretends they make that kind of food, but the authentic place, it's in Queens. Or if the soccer team I follow, or if they're doing a live, um, you know, broadcast of it, I know I can go to a bar, usually it's in Queens. For whatever reason, Queens is so diverse that they seem to have all of this. And the point he made to me is, it's not just that, that New York has the diversity, it's that New York is completely comfortable with the diversity. As a result, he can move people around the world into this working environment and know that they will find a community here. And that character is really what is the essence of the city. I mean, we like to think it's our, our skyscrapers, and certainly that's part of the magic of New York. It's part of the, um, if you will, uh, the logo of New York. But what we fill that skyscraper with are people from everywhere right. and people with every conceivable skill set. Now, and, I, and, and I frequently point to um, New York's competitive advantage is it's this magnet for, for talent. And to your point, it's diverse talent from people around the world. It's diverse talent from all different industries uh, and expertise that you can't get anywhere else. And you're getting the best, the brightest, the most in innovative, the most um, you know, aspiring people from around the world want to locate to New York. And I always have, as I've, as I've looked at the, where to invest around New York or talk to companies as to where they're locating, it's they look for those nodes of where that, that talent is and what would make that more attractive. And even in this recovery, what's been amazing to me, you know, post COVID is the talents come back to New York, right? We've seen a situation here now where the apartments went from 80% occupied to now 95% occupied. The restaurants are filled. The parks are filled. Broadway's open. People are going to museum. The streets are open. Uh, but people aren't back in the office buildings yet, right? We're about 30% occupied uh, generally in, in the buildings. And so why do you think now that the talent's here, they've decided to come back. They didn't flee and not come back. Why are we not getting them back in the office? I, I think the first thing is that we've picked up different work patterns and habits and a, a habit drives so much of what we do. And we've gotten comfortable with something that doesn't require us to be in the office. I think that the more the characteristic New York FOMO kicks in, that you're missing out if you're not in the office, people will begin to gravitate back. I mean, there, I have to say this, I think it's already happening. And I think that it is a case of now needing to find new ways of engaging the work environment, but I'm not of a mind that it's translating to less space. And I'll tell you, tell you something else. There was a, um, a, a feature of how space was used. You know, we've had this evolving trend to try and take less and less office space. Let's, uh, you know, we go all the way back to the cubicles, right? Let's, let's make it generic. Let's make it uh, tighter. Let's make it so that it doesn't cost us much to move people around or reconfigure departments. And we had also been trending toward, let's do hoteling. Nobody has assigned seats. You come in, you'll see what's available that day. CBRE, by the way, uses that model in a lot of parts of the country and the world. I can tell you that in an environment where you want people to come back to work, I don't think they're gonna be as compelled to come back if they show up at the concierge desk and say, hi, where am I sitting today? Yeah, and, and actually, so in the, in the short term, there's a little bit of a psychology issue in terms of people 
get, breaking through, realizing that COVID is no longer this public health crisis. We're 85% vaccinated um, and it, it, they're comfortable living and interacting and going to Broadway shows and movie theaters. They'll get comfortable coming to work as soon as the policy is set in place to your point. And then longer term, the 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 the, the workplace is going to be different. And we, as you noted, began to see some of those trends, but I think COVID accelerated the trends of thinking about the workplace to be something that needs to be more magnetic, right? Something that you do need, you use the word need to draw people back into the office. So they got to come to be engaged with their peers, um, you know, thinking that they're having the opportunity for upward mobility, mentorship, productivity, a sense of purpose. When you talk to your clients now, do they think about having to uh, design their space differently? Do they think about different types of buildings that they would go to uh, closer to public transportation? What are the things now in a post-COVID world that's important to them? In New York City, being near a transit hub has always uh, been a, a key differentiator for a, uh, a building. I think what to me is most interesting in this first phase of the recovery is that it is, every recovery I've ever experienced has the initial flight to quality, right? This is a cliche that we've all said to each other over the years. It's absolutely true. Wow, now for the same rent I was paying here, I can pay that and be in that better building. And people don't necessarily say, I want something cheaper um, than I have now. It's typically what people do is wanna to go to quality. I have never seen it more pronounced than now. And in fact, we keep saying that 80% of the leasing is happening in 10% of the buildings. And we're seeing, it, it, it's not that they're leaving the space that they're gonna go into a space that is of comparable price, but higher quality. They're paying more to be in the space that is totally differentiated. And what does that mean? First of all, it means that it has a good location, good transit access. It means that there is light and air. I cannot tell you how I think um, undervalued it has been. The idea of being, being able to bring light into a workplace and people to see sort of the, the, the sun move through the sky in the course of the day, not necessarily literally, but to experience it. Yeah. I mean, and then obviously one that is uh, got good air filtration. Uh, again, for the first time ever, people really are making that a criteria. You know, we would talk about wellness and all of that, and they, they nod. Now it's actually on the list. And uh, just all issues relating to sustainability, and even the recognition, only 30% of the carbon emissions that come from buildings come from the base building system. The rest is coming from the tenant. We're beginning to see this consciousness that this building will make our operations more uh, efficient. And we have ESG slash DEI goals that the building itself aligns with. We'll be able to give ourselves credit as we put forward our annual report on these matters. So that whole dynamic of the value system being overlaid on the real estate, that's actually a pretty new thing. So I do think that these trends were there, Scott. I just think that, like everything else, um, the pandemic accelerated. Right. We don't. And th this time, you, you've talked about other cycles, right? In this economic cycle, we're seeing the economic recovery, like we saw in the multifamily side, recover, and and you'll see some of that in the office market. But to your point, there's also a structural shift that some of this space isn't going to be competitive. And and you know, I, I like to think about what happened when e-commerce. Um, came about and people could buy things online and how people decided whether they were going to go to a mall or shopping center um, anymore. And if you could buy it online, they'd buy it online unless going to that mall was an experience, it was engaging. Uh, you felt like you were go having an outing for the day. Um, I think there's that's an analogy for the office space, right? If you can work remotely, uh, you will, unless going to the office space, you're going to a place that uh, you're, you're around your peers that there's energy within the building, that there's energy in the community surrounding the building, that neighborhood, it's easy to get to, so that public transportation is important. And if you don't have that, the buildings that really can't compete, I'm just not sure they're gonna actually recover in this cycle. They may become structurally competitively obsolete, like we've seen with class B malls, 
in, in the retail space. Or like we saw with um, office buildings downtown in the aftermath of 9-11. Didn't that turn out well? Meaning right. what happened with those buildings? Because I, I am a complete, uh, in a complete agreement. You know, if you show me um, an office building, I'm not gonna, I, I don't wanna malign any avenue in, or street in Manhattan, but that is a bit of a hike from transit. And there's not too much in Manhattan that's like that, but there is some. So it's gotta be a hike. The slab heights are 10 feet, 10 feet six, as was built all the time. The columns are 20 feet on center. Um, maybe it has punched windows. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I don't know, either knock it down or, you know, figure out how 441 ninth, something like that, where you sort of reach into it, gut the thing and do all manner of, of uh, redevelopment to it and replace all the systems, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll have a nice building that will attract reasonable rents. Um, but it won't be the same thing as anybody who's actually, um, again, I, I do want to stress that there are some buildings with the bones that if you update the infrastructure of the building and you uh, deal with the public spaces in the building in a way that's attractive, our own project together, 550 Madison, uh, that building is, is like a movie star. It's a movie star who's had extraordinarily good surgery because it is over 30 years old um, but when you enter it, it's hard to imagine that there is a more beautiful building in the city and that doesn't meet the moment because it's column free, it's slab heights are 14 feet, um, it has you know, light all the way back to the core. And then of course, all the proportions are so graceful, the gift of a great architect. Right. Um, but I think that, I think that uh, any sort of uh, undifferentiated generic building um, might well be put to another purpose. Yeah, but I mean, you know, you, the the point of buildings having character and creating a sense of community, another building that we've worked on together, and you, uh, you know, originally brought Martha Stewart back to, was the Starrett Lehigh, a building in Chelsea, 100 years old, um, that has that character that you talk about. But again, you know, it, it is able to be competitive, even though it's old, but sometimes that maturity and that authenticity um, and the bones, as you uh, refer to it, is so unique, it makes it that much more compelling than what a new building could even potentially try to replicate. There's nothing generic about Starrett. Um, and I think that that's why I am never one to write off a great, great a flat iron. We're in the process of repositioning the flat iron now. In, it's the opposite of you know, how Starrett has those big floors and it's kind of this, I think of it right. as a great, masculine building. The flat iron floors are tiny and they're spectacular. If you're 10,600 square feet, you couldn't work. It's like, it would be like working on a cloud that's kind of floating over the city because again, another great architect, Burnham. Um, Daniel Burnham cited the building brilliantly, made the, again, always the proportion of window to wall. As with Starrett, as with 550, brings the light at flat iron all the way in. So you've got these it's hard to realize until you're inside. It's almost like a glass curtain wall building, except it's got this fabulous terracotta facade. Anyway, I say all of this to say, New York is blessed with a fair number of those buildings, but we got tons and tons of other kinds of buildings, but we have uses for them. Whether it's apartment buildings, whether we're gonna turn some of them into schools, whether we're gonna turn some of them into dormitories, um, life science buildings, et cetera. They're, um, New York's ability to morph its real estate is again part of the success base of the city. And and, and you know you um, had a, a a front row seat when we went through nine eleven, and uh, you know as an example of an existential situation where people questioned whether or not New York and particularly Lower Manhattan would ever be competitive again. And uh, you know you were part of the rebuilding of Lower Manhattan and the releasing of Lower Manhattan and seeing its vibrancy. I, I, I'm for, it would be interesting to get your take in terms of how that rebound occurred and how we should think about that as we think about the rebound of New York coming out of the COVID crisis. Well, I, I think that the 9-11 experience, and you were right there shoulder to shoulder, Scott, in terms of the rebuilding um, from your work at the Port Authority, 
at the Trade Center. But I think that if you experienced what we experienced, your, your belief in New York's resiliency and uh, ca capacity for, for reinvention is like, okay, I dealt with, this is, is it, I dealt with worse. And, and, and let me say what it was like. Um, first of all, downtown had been in a long-term decline before 9-11. And I remember, I always have this uh, board presentation that I did where I was presenting uh, what I thought was gonna be a final deal uh, to a financial service firm that I, thought, that I thought I was moving downtown. And at the end of the meeting, they elected not to go to this downtown location. And after the meeting, I spoke to one of the directors of the firm, a lady, and I said, well, I was actually surprised um, that they had decided to go against the move and that they were gonna stay in Midtown. And she said to me, oh, come on, Mary. She said, you know as well as I, there's no place you could get your nails done downtown. And I remember both being astonished and then realizing, of course, she was absolutely right. And what happened after 9-11 is that pricing restructured, buildings emptied out, businesses began to realize that it was affordable to operate their stores or their nail salons or their dry cleaners, wherever it was there. And then in the process of rebuilding the trade center, we saw the ultimate resilience of New York, which is its ability to attract new types of businesses and populate the workforce. Because the thing I always say when I'm down at the Trade Center is that I look at the buildings and I realize that so many of the people populating those buildings today either didn't exist as a company at 9-11 or they were tiny sort of gleams in the eye of the entrepreneur who was creating them. And no one ever thought a company called Spotify was going to occupy 700,000 square feet of full world trade. The deal that I always look to you as being the godfather of, the anchor of Three World Trade Center, is a company, Group M, uh, WPP, the global conglomerate's most valuable company today, started in 1999 in now 725,000 square feet there. Uber, 300,000 square feet. I mean, you can, you can keep going down the list and realizing Nobody thought these were, the, these buildings were designed for financial service firms, but the city again, that's why I, I stress the diversity of the talent, because it, you talk to each of these companies and say, so tell us why you're here. Um, you know, a Swedish company like Spotify, they're very clear on the kinds of talent New York has that they're not getting in Stockholm, they're not getting in LA, they're not getting in London. And they know it was, there is nothing random about these companies being there. Although, by the way, I think I've, I've told you this before. Uh, Spotify also said the connectivity to Newark Airport where all the Swedish airlines fly from, uh, which is the base for the Swedish airlines in, uh, in New York, was you know the final sort of uh, icing on the cake of the Trade Center. I think it's really good uh, in some of the points you made about being intentional and policy and planning, driving the future growth, right? And, and, and reimagining Lower Manhattan post 9-11 to be a live, work, play environment where took older office buildings and converted them into residential, which attracted restaurants and small businesses and conveniences for people that live there, made streetscapes alive, not just nine to five when people were coming to work, but 24 uh, seven along the way and created an energy that was compelling, then created new product in terms of the, the office product at Trade Center that attracted these, these companies with public transit in the, uh, available with the path and, uh, and subway systems right there, and then tied even an infrastructure of the airport to your point, right? So I think the, lots of times when it was New Yorkers, we walk around and see new buildings going up or new neighborhoods coming and think, oh, this just happens. The reality is, you know, it, it's the planning the decades before and the investment in these types of, of, of infrastructure and quality of life uh, the elements that make these things become a reality. I do have to say too, look at how much good happened because the federal government 
had found a reason to invest in New York. I mean, I think often about how all of the, of the copper in the, all of the infrastructure of downtown was rebuilt in the aftermath of 9-11, most of it with federal money. And wouldn't it be great if we had a continued investment so that we could deal with the resiliency, the climate resiliency of downtown? It's, so long as we have people willing to invest in us, I think New York has a pretty good track record of being able to make a brilliant return on that investment. And, and I think that um, this is an yet again, another opportunity for us to take a look at uh, where that money should be deployed and, and how to uh, uh, and how to use it to make something good come out of it. Right, and, it's so, a, uh, and, a, and a chance to reimagine and also create policies that actually incent private investment um, to help form some of those changes. So like in lower Manhattan, being a, a place where we're converting buildings for uh, apartments, you know, can we do the same in Midtown so our commercial districts aren't all reliant on office users, but there's a mix and we have these, you know, walkable neighborhoods uh, in, in Midtown, or, you know, I know you were involved in uh, in Grand Central and the whole uh, East uh, Midtown East rezoning, which I don't think people appreciate when they now watch J.P. Morgan's building go up or one Vanderbilt go up. Can you describe that for people? Because I don't, everyone may not be aware of it and, and how impactful so, that is. So I, I have to tell you, I, I I try to remember the date. It actually, wasn't that long ago. I'm guessing tw I, I was chairman of the real estate board in 2010, so it had to be either late 2010 or 2011. And I was invited to have uh, uh, Amanda Burton, who was then head of city planning, invited me to lunch. And at the lunch, she said, so what should we, meaning city planning of New York, be thinking about? And I said to her, you should look at Midtown East because it is inarguably the city's most valuable office stock. And it has aged out totally. The average age of the buildings at that point were over 70 years of age. And I said to her, no one is ever going to take these buildings down. So we have, you know, again, the perfect transportation hub that it possesses. We have, you know, the reputation of what Midtown East is, meaning Park Avenue, et cetera. Um, and we've got a situation where it isn't going to be economically feasible to bring a building down and build a new, which is really what needs to happen. So being the extremely bright uh, woman that she is, she, they launched into a full-blown study. And um, it, it was a, a, an interestingly iterative process. And one of the things I give them the greatest respect for is they brought our industry into the discussion. The, the, they actually listened. To their immense credit, they did office use as of right. The other thing I pleaded for was um, the right to um, have uh, the upzoning apply to residential as well. Here, I did not uh, succeed so well because this is, this is an office district. We, we don't see that we wanna mingle these two. I am hopeful, given what we've just been through, that we go back and say, let's revisit that aspect because Midtown East is already paying benefits. Again, no, another great thing. Um, the original discussion, they wanted to do it like Hudson Yards, meaning um, when the air rights uh, were being assigned, they wanted, to, they wanted to price the air rights. Effectively, they wanted to set up a little uh, bureau that would uh, adjust pricing for air rights. So, and I said, you don't need a special committee for this. Just give a toll whatever that toll is. So again, you can sit down on a napkin. That's the beauty of this. You can sit down on a napkin and figure out, is this even worth spending any time on? As opposed to, hmm, will I get that special permit? Hmm, what will these air rights cost me? You're now in a situation that allows you to move forward. And like magic, we have the magic that JP Morgan is doing. We have the beautiful one Vanderbilt and what I know will be the extraordinary. Um, uh, Project Commodore. Right. So I, I said, we're going to see a whole lot more. You know, to, to, to your point, for people who don't really experience me talking about special permit, right? It's just, 
is part of the challenge is when you deal with, with city and government agencies, having to go through the regulatory process creates uncertainty. So by having the rules of the game really clear, you knew that if you met certain requirements, you could build a bigger building and take down a smaller building, right? And I think that was really the, that simplicity that you described was in, in the impetus that gave the private sector the willingness to invest the capital to either acquire buildings or, or, or accumulate the, their own building or tear down their own building to build again. And which we're not really talking about as part of that, uh, invest in infrastructure, which JP Morgan has done and one variable has done and others that are doing this, where they're, they're using private sector capital to bring us new subway stations, expansions of Grand Central, new concourses, uh, et cetera, and up to tunes of almost a billion dollars now of private sector infrastructure. We had a very receptive government under Mayor Bloomberg and then under the first, uh, uh, the first de Blasio administration. Remember, he's the one who did it for us. Make no mistake. And they were, they were able to understand the big jump it was economically for someone to commit to do what had to be done. Um, and as a result, they were able to meet them, maybe not halfway, but they, they were able to pull back expectations to put it in the realm of, of possibility. And it also uh, you know, speaks to the point that you made earlier about companies willing to pay for higher quality buildings, because here you have JP Morgan making this massive investment, even in the face of the pandemic and commitment to New York. One Vanderbilt, which was when the pandemic hit, I think was something like 50 or 60% occupied has now almost become 100% or high 90% occupied at some of the highest rents New York has ever seen. Again, this isn't a pandemic where people aren't occupying office buildings. So I think it just echoes the point of people want quality, want to be close to transportation. Uh, and Grand Central has that. And then the other you know piece of Grand Central I just want to hit for a second is uh, East Side Access, which again, a lot of people in our community haven't really been exposed to because this has been a project going on for decades, which is basically a whole nother train station underneath Grand Central with eight tracks that are going to enable people coming in from Long Island to go to uh, the east side of Manhattan versus having to go to Penn Station. So the the flow of that workforce, that talent pool uh, becomes even, even more apparent. So one final question for you. So we have uh, a new mayor coming in, likely to be Eric Adams. Um, you know, we're on the verge of, uh, of the new, the great New York reopening that we've been talking about with 85% of the people vaccinated, but we still, this is a pivotal point in, uh, in our city's recovery. So if, if you, he called you and asked for a few pieces of advice, what would your top advice be for him to focus on to help us as we emerge through this COVID crisis? Uh, I, I think that I would, of course, begin which tell him that the fundamentals always apply and that the city needs to feel safe, that the city needs to be clean. The city also needs um, an education system um, that welcomes talent in all its forms and doesn't try to, um, I don't know, it makes children embrace learning in whatever form they want but doesn't try to make uh, children homogenous in any way. I, I envision that this new mayor would get all of that. And I would hope that he will hire people who are really qualified in all of those areas because it would be fantastic to hit the ground running as opposed to having somebody who really had a steep learning curve in any of them. Uh, I think I would then say to him that he needs to set goals and break down barriers um, that we have set up. Uh, you've heard me talk about my concern about the city council and the mem member deference becoming a kind of de facto veto over the best laid plans of city hall. And of the, I think of the general, pop, the young general populace of New York. And at the end of the day, he needs to have courage that if he acts upon these things, um, the citizenry will rise up to, to, to meet him on it and not allow the Twitter feed or um, any other um, sm small group with a big voice to deter him uh, from the goals.
and uh, I'm, I'm just, again, I'm a naturally optimistic person. I almost think in our world, you have to be that way, but obviously my bias. And I, I think that he will uh, attempt to do that. And uh, it's what we need. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And I do have confidence that uh, he gets the points that you're raising. I hope he does call you, which would be great to take uh, your decades of, of wisdoms and learning of uh, helping us through New York and lead through some of the, the great challenges to some of the great rebuildings that you've been part of. So thank you for taking the time today to share your insights. And uh, I look forward to, to living the next decade of New York's new vibrancy with you. Same here. Thank you so much for the invitation, Scott. I always enjoy time with you and it's always mentally stimulating for sure. Same way. Thanks, Take Marianne. Care. Appreciate it. That concludes this week's episode of Recalibrate Reality. As you just heard, one of New York's many attributes is its ability for reinvention. Office space in New York City will and should change, and that's a good thing. Like we learned after 9-11, we now have an opportunity to create new neighborhoods with central business districts that better reflect the needs of a post-COVID world. Thank you again to Marianne Tai and CBRE, and thank you to the Regional Plan Association, the 92nd Street Y, and to the team for making this week's episode possible. I'm Scott Reckler from 75 Rockefeller Plaza in New York, See you in two weeks.